because it says when it's the worst is when you just have a little bit. Please rise. This United States District Court for the Western District of Washington is now in session. The Honorable Marsha J. Peckman presiding. Please be seated. This is a matter of Julie Delasio versus the University of Washington, cause number C-17-642-MJP. Counsel, please make your appearance for the record. Oh, good afternoon, Your Honor. My name is Janie Freeman. I am a Special Assistant Attorney General representing the defendants in this matter. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Your Honor. My name is Joseph Thomas, and I'm pro bono counsel for Plaintiff Julie Delasio. Good afternoon, and I understand that we've made arrangements that Ms. Delasio is on the phone listening to us. Yes, Your Honor. That's my understanding. All right. Counsel, we're here for our second round of summary judgment motions, and I have had an opportunity to read the defendant's second motion for summary judgment, the plaintiff's response, the defendant's reply, the objection to new evidence of defendant's reply to the second motion for summary judgment, the defendant's response to the plaintiff's objection. And so I also drafted a series of questions that you should have received that I would like you to answer during the course of your oral argument this afternoon. You don't have to take them in order, but at some point during your argument, I ask that you answer the questions. So, defense, who will speak? I will, Your Honor. All right. Would you like me to approach the podium? If you would, please. Thank you. Does this one work? Okay. Thank you, Your Honor. Because this is a second round of a second summary judgment motion, and the court has addressed a number of the issues in this case already, I will try to be brief and get to the point and address the question that the court posed to us. As we know, this is a case involving a public records release that occurred in 2015 that we've been referring to as the Betz request, and that was a situation where a citizen made a public records request to the University of Washington for records related to Ms. D'Alessio, the plaintiff here, who had previously worked for the University of Washington but no longer worked there. Records were released. They were heavily redacted, and hundreds of pages were withheld pursuant to public records exemptions. The court has already ruled dismissing plaintiff's claims that were based on various pieces of information that were either not redacted or, well, that were not redacted, and has dismissed the claims against all of the individual defendants based on that. We're here today to address really the same issues and the same claims based only on pieces of information that were produced that Ms. D'Alessio claims constitute private medical information. And at this point in the case, the only defendants that remain are four individual defendants, Allison Swenson, the individual university employee who did redact and produce the records, Andrew Palmer, who is an individual employee in the public records office, who subsequently produced a set of the same copies in an unredacted fashion only to Ms. D'Alessio herself and never to any third party, Perry Tapper, who is a supervisor in the office, and then Eliza Saunders, who is the director of the Office of Public Records. And the remaining claims are based on 1983 claims based on 14th Amendment privacy interests and Fourth Amendment search and seizure. Your Honor, I think there's been a lot of briefing and some rulings already on issues of qualified immunity. The specific question that you addressed to the defendants to discuss today related to the plaintiff's argument about a pattern or practice, the court has already ruled on a number of key elements in this case, and I'll just list them quickly. Number one, that negligence cannot support a constitutional claim or a 1983 claim. Nothing has changed there. Second, that individual defendants are entitled to qualified immunity under 1983 if they did not intentionally violate clearly established law. 
Um, there has been a lot of discussion, briefing, and some rulings about whether the law is clearly established in this area. And I believe as we are approaching today with the number of questions the court has had on, on this issue as it is, um, have turned its attention to medical information, has be, one thing that has become clear is that the law in this area is even less clear. Um, there are no precedential cases that provide a distinct uh, ruling on the precise issues that we have here before us today on similar facts. Um, but what we have done is draw from other, other areas of qualified immunity and constitutional law to demonstrate that a constitutional violation did not occur here. So when we get to the, the argument of pattern and practice, um, I believe the defendants have already established that each of the individual defendants are entitled to qualified immunity from plaintiff's claims. Number one, uh, well, basic, basically because plaintiff still has not proven a constitutional violation at all. In order to uh, get past qualified immunity against individual defendants, the plaintiff has to demonstrate that an intentional act occurred, that a constitutional violation actually occurred, and then we look at whether each of those individual defendants should have known at the time that what they were doing as part of their job duties violated Ms. D'Alessio's constitutional rights and then went ahead and did it intentionally anyway, knowing that that would occur. Um, there is no evidence that any of the, the individual defendants here um, took any such, such action. The evidence also does not establish that a constitutional violation occurred at all. Um, the court has already ruled with regard to the Fourth Amendment search and seizure issue um, that the facts here do not establish a constitutional violation. That ruling should apply exactly the same to any information that is allegedly private medical information as it did to any information that was data. Um, the defendants in this case took no different action with regard to um, administering their Public Records Act responsibilities, receiving, respo receiving requests, requesting files from the various employment uh, departments where Ms. D'Alessio worked, and then administering um, various exemptions and whatnot under the, um, under the PRA. With respect to the 14th Amendment claim, and I believe this is where Ms. D'Alessio really focuses her efforts, um, even with regard to information that she characterizes as medical information, um, we still need to go through the same analysis. Number one, intentional act. Number two, still looking at the difference between a privacy interest in medical information and a constitutional right, um, the constitutional right of privacy. The cases that we've cited in the case law makes clear that a constitutional right to privacy is much, much higher and, and very distinguishable from a mere interest in privacy. And has made clear that even information that might be medical information um, does not necessarily always rise to the level of constitutionally protected medical information. The information that is disclosed and the context in which it was disclosed and the pers people who it was disclosed to must be shocking, egregiously embarrassing, and uh, other terms like that that the, um, that the courts use to describe uh, information that meets the standard. Um, understanding that there is no evidence that could overcome qualified immunity for each individual defendant here. The plaintiff has thrown out language uh, of, quote, uh, practice and policy, um, or widespread policy, sorry. Um, what's the language, the pattern or practice, excuse me. Um, that language only arises in cases involving claims against municipalities, um, typically where we're not looking at an individual actor anymore or the liability of an individual actor, but we're looking at the li potential liability of a municipality. The fundamental underlying um, elements of a 1983 constitutional claim are still there, though. Number one, there has to be intentional conduct. But number two, there has to be evidence uh, and proof of a constitutional violation, not just a pattern and practice of something, or even a pattern or practice of negligence. There has to be evidence of a pattern or practice of constitutional violations. So the very first starting point, if we look at policy and practice language, um, has to start with finding that a constitutional violation occurred, and then go on to see if it's occurred again and again to the point where the municipality or the governmental organization um, should know 
that if they keep sending their people out there and telling them to do this, you know, say, let's say tasers are a new thing and police officers are told to go out and shoot tasers into people's heads um, and, and, and then they keep telling them to do that and they say, yes, this is what we tell our people to do and that is ruled a clear excessive use of force. Those are the types of situations where we usually see pattern or practice questions arise is where we see, for example, in police cases, um, police departments tell their officers to go use certain equipment, take certain action in certain, certain circumstances, um, and then see it in action and see that it is actually an excessive use of force, hear from the courts that it's an excessive use of force in violation of the Constitution, and then continue telling them to do it the same way. Um, we don't have those facts here. We also don't have a defendant to which a pattern or practice type claim applies. We have four individuals here. Um, plaintiffs are using pattern or practice language um, and the, the way it is put is that pattern and practice in and of itself is somehow a higher standard than negligence, but it's still not a standard that establishes a constitutional claim. Um, it is If plaintiff's argument is that um, they believe or they allege that information may have been inadvertently disclosed at different times related to different people, that in and of itself, even if it were true, does not establish a, a violation of Ms. D'Alessio's constitutional rights, nor does it establish a, con a claim of constitutional magnitude or a 1983 claim against Ms. Swenson, Mr. Palmer, Ms. Saunders, or uh, Mr. Tapper, who are the only remaining defendants in this case. Um, and, your, um, and I will turn the argument over to plaintiff because I believe there are some questions that you wanted to address there unless you have questions for me, Your Honor. I don't. Thank you, Ms. Okay. Freeman. Thank you. Mr. Thomas. Thank you, Your Honor. So I spent a lot of time this morning going over the court's questions, and so I'd just like to um, address those directly unless the court has any other questions that it would like to ask in the meantime. So feel free to interrupt. Um, this is about the court's understanding, so I'm going to try my best to answer all questions that I can. Thank you. So the first question that this court had was um, about the case authority um, for the position of providing confidential materials to plaintiff at her own request um, and whether that's a violation of her own privacy right. I think basically what this court wants to know is when plaintiff receives documents about herself, is that violating her own pri privacy rights, if I understand it correctly? And plaintiff's response to that is um, there's no evidence in the record that the documents that Ms. D'Alessio received of the private medical information was only produced to herself. Um, there's evidence in the record from Docket 37 and Docket 30, well, I think, first of all, it was Docket 34, pages 69 through 77, that at least some of the information was produced to Mr. Betts first. And then second, it was produced to Ms. D'Alessio. And so under, this, under the standard for summary judgment, this court has to look at all reasonable inferences from that evidence. And the evidence would suggest that it's been um, distributed to multiple people. And in fact, um, defendants have made no attempt to improve or no attempt to approve that subsequent events um, have made it clear that the alleged wrong, wrongful behavior cannot be reasonably expected to occur. And that's a citation from FTC versus Affordable Media LLC 179 F3rd. 1228, and that's on page 1239, and that's the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals case from 1999. Mr. Thomas, aside from the plaintiff and the person making the original request, what proof do you have that the, her information was distributed any place else? Your Honor, um, that's something that I've been talking about with defense counsel um, over the last couple days, and there is nothing in the record. Um, plaintiffs admit that there is nothing in the record right now other than what was just mentioned, um, but there is newly discovered evidence that will be submitted to this court in due course um, over the next couple days um, that will go to establish that it has been given to third parties subsequently. And this is where the FTC versus affordable media standard comes in, is that defendants have not made any attempt to prove that 
um, the evidence has uh, that these documents have not been given to third parties, and I don't want to um, talk about things that aren't in the record right now. So, well, let's talk a little bit about whose burden it is to prove it. Isn't that your burden and not the defense's to prove? Your Honor, um, I appreciate you asking that question because I would respectfully submit that that is information within. Um, defendants um, purview and that's something that they have to submit so if we look at the Public Records Act in RCW 42.56.550 section 1 the reason why the Washington State Legislature um, gave the burden in Public Records Act cases to the government is because defendant can't be uh, to prove whether there's an unlawful withholding or not is because the plaintiff can't be reasonably be assumed to know whether the, the government has withheld that information or not that's something that's within the realm of knowledge for the defendants and I would respectfully submit to this court that that's something that the defendants have to prove um, and then also, um, I, to, to go to answer this first question again, um, I would also um, respectfully submit to this court that the Fourth Amendment um, has a different answer than the Fourteenth Amendment to this question. So again, the question is um, whether um, providing confidential information to plaintiff at her own request is a violation of plaintiff's First Amendment rights. And it seems like uh, we argued, um, plaintiff argued in the response brief on page 13 through 16 that um, the commingling of the documents under the Fourth Amendment was its own violation. And so I would respectfully submit to this court that there's two separate violations that we've been arguing and I don't know if that's been abundantly clear or not. And the first violation is the search and the seizure. So it's actually going to get the documents where they shouldn't be going. Um, this is private information. There's a lot of case law that says um, medical information is constitutionally protected. It's private. Defendants knew that they shouldn't be going to um, search that area, and it was unreasonable for them to do so. Whether the ADA and the HIPAA were even looked at, um, there's independent basis just from case law saying that they shouldn't be doing this and it's unconstitutional. So even the mere fact of going and searching through these areas and seizing it and commingling it with public records that can then later be produced to people is a violation of the Fourth Amendment. So when this court asks, um, is providing plaintiff her own information um, a violation of her rights? I would absolutely say yes, because it violates her Fourth Amendment rights to even be getting that information that shouldn't have even been searched or seized in that matter and commingled. So let me move on to this court's second question. Um, and the court asked, plaintiff alleges the documents um, in docket 34 um, pages 69 through 77 contain protected health, medical or health information and the disclosure of which um, violated constitutional rights. Explain um, what constitutionally protected information um, is contained in each of the documents cited. So before I get to that, um, I want to quote um, the case Henry Crawford, which has been cited a lot. It's Henry Crawford, 194, F3rd, 9, 954, page 959 and it's the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals case from 1999. And that case says, quote, the right to informational privacy, however, is not absolute. Rather, it's a conditional right which may be infringed upon a showing of proper governmental interest, end quote. And they go ahead and they give a balancing test in order to determine whether the right is infringed or not. It's a seven-point balancing test. So in order to answer this court's question, I'm going to go over the seven-point balancing test. The first point that they use in order to look at this is the type of records requested. And so in um, docket 34, pages 69 through 77, these types of records are medical information about Ms. D'Alessio's disabilities, which is protected from disclosure. And um, Conroy versus the New York State Department of Correctional Services, 333 F. 3rd, um, 88 at page 96, which is a Second Circuit Court of Appeals case from 2003, said, quote, even where a diagnosis alone is not sufficient to establish an employee is disabled, the diagnosis may give rise to the perception of the disability and discrimination on the basis the perceived disability is also prohibited, end quote. And so it's, so what the court is trying to say is you don't even have to go so far as to say um, the exact disability is this. There's anything that gives rise to the mere perception of a disability is um, prohibited medical information in order to even produce. 
And that's what happens here when they're even um, giving out disability documents. And I'll, I'll go into that in more detail, especially on the second point. So the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals in the Crawford case says they want to look at the information um, it does or might contain the documents. And so in docket um, 34, pages 69 through 77, um, especially in docket 34, at page 69, it talks about the accommodation request for a disability or serious <coughs> medical condition, and that's a direct quote from page 69. And so this already outlines that it's a disability or serious medical condition. At docket 34, pages 71 through 73, um, states that it talks about Ms. D'Alessio's temporary accommodation with troubled pipe pitting. I didn't know what pipe pitting was. Apparently, what pipe pitting is, is you hold something in your hand and you push down on it with your thumb. And so when it says that she has trouble pipe hitting, it says that she has trouble moving her thumb. And that is talking about a direct disability. It talks about um, that she has problems with the range of motion in her thumb or able to use that long term. So at docket 34, um, pages 74 through 77, identifies a form filled out by Ms. D'Alessio's supervisor um, evaluating her physical needs for the job um, submitted, quote, for a, phys physician, a physician statement, end quote, and whether, um, quote, this employee can perform the job duties described above given their current physical restrictions, end quote. So it talks about a physical disability. It describes it as a serious physical disability. It actually describes one of the disabilities as trouble pipe hitting, which is the, um, mo the movement of the thumb. And so this talks about medical information in this, in these documents. Um, and the third point that the Crawford Court wants to look at is the potential harm and any subsequent non-consensual disclosures. Ms. D'Alessio never consented to this disclosure. And as the clear and unequivocal um, case law that's already been produced to this court states that once something is in the public record, you can't unring that bell. Once it's in the public record, it's always in the public record, and you immediately lose your privacy interest in that. So Ms. D'Alessio was harmed when it was placed in the public record. Um, the fourth, fourth point the Crawford Court wants to look at is the injury from the disclosure to the relationship in which the record was generated. Um, Ms. D'Alessio didn't ask about this. This was disclosed to Mr. Betts herself, and there's a strong likelihood that the evidence will show that it's to others, um, too. The fifth point the Crawford Court wants to look at is the adequacy of the safeguards to prevent unauthorized disclosure, and um, that um, there are no policies. This was, this was argued for the court in um, initial disclosures about whether there was policies or procedures. Ms. D'Alessio found in the Washington Administrative Code that there were policies and procedures that defendants didn't produce. And they said, okay, well, that's all of them. Um, there are no policies and procedures to stop this sort of disclosure. Um, they, they make these decisions um, based upon unwritten policies, so there's nothing in the record that would evidence that any sort of policy to stop this, and it hasn't been argued in this case yet. Um, the sixth point that the Crawford Court wants to look at is the degree or the need um, for access and whether there is an express or statutory mandate. Um, these documents are exempt from disclosure. Um, there's a statutory mandate in RCW 42.56.070 subsection 1 says that Agencies, quote, shall make available for public inspection and copying all records unless exempt by statute. These are exempt by statute, and so they shall not be, um, shall not be disclosed. Um, and the, the seventh and final point that the Crawford Court talks about is the articulated public policy or other recognizable public interest in militating towards access. Um, defendants are silent as to any other public policy or interests, and this was argued by defendants in their response um, to the motion to the second motion for summary judgment. Um, specifically, um, on pages, I say 13 through 16 in here, but there's a specific page in there, and I don't want to waste the time in looking that up, where we actually argue that they they don't state a compelling interest or an interest um, to counteract or uh, weigh. Um, the disclosure. Um, does that answer this court's question? That's fine, counsel. Okay. So the third question is, um, does plaintiffs have any evidence that, um, that any protected information was deliberately included um, to the documents included to Mr. Betts? And first of all, um, we started out the motion for the response to the motion for summary judgment by talking about um, 
Ms. Sa Ms. Defendant Saunders' job description. Defendant Sa Saunders, um, by being the director of the Office of Public Records, is also the um, public records officer. That's identified in docket 130-1. And um, her job description specifically states, as we st stated in the response to the motion for summary judgment, that part of her job is to avoid lawsuits. It's to mitigate risk. And how she does that is by over-disclosing documents. Um, under the Public Records Act, there's no violation of the Public Records Act if you over-disclose documents. There's only a violation of the Public Records Act is if you wrongfully um, don't disclose those documents or you withhold those documents. And so um, they can avoid liability by producing documents that they know are exempt or could be challenged to be exempt. And um, so that's evidence. There's also a pattern and practice of disclosing private information that is exempt from the Public Records Act that the defendants um, deliberately acted. Um, first of all, um, they produced documents to Mr. Betts, as was talked about before. That's in docket 34 in pages 69 through 77. They produced documents to Ms. D'Alessio. That's in docket 38 at pages 22 through 25. In docket 38, pages 15 through 16. Um, in docket 38, pages 4 through 13. And these were all um, explained in the response to the motion for summary judgment. So in order to save time, I'm not going to explain what are exactly in these documents unless the court has questions and wants me to. Well, I think perhaps you misunderstand my underlining of the word deliberately. Let's assume that this, these documents got out negligently. Do you have any, any evidence that somebody looked at this and says, ah, I know how to fix her. I'm going to disclose this document as opposed to being careless or negligent in calling or whiting out or blocking out the information. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, how I would respond to that is um, um, Defendant Saunders is, uh, is highly trained, and Defendant Saunders actually in her job description in Docket 130-1 um, states that she is expected to know about HIPAA and the ADA in order to stop those documents from being disclosed. And so she's supposed to be able to identify and to look at this. Um, she has training in this. And um, pursuant to 42. Or RCW 42.56.580 subsection 1, um, as the public records officer, Defendant Saunders is expected to oversee compliance with the Public Records Act. That's her state mandated position. And so um, when she has training in this, her job description says that she is expected to know about this subject matter. And um, it happens at least two times and possibly more. A pattern in practice arises, and at least this is a deliberate indifference, and this could be very well intentional. And I think the reasonable inference from this evidence is that it very well could be um, intentional, but I think it's too early in order to make that um, call yet because the evidence is not there, and I think that this is a disputed issue of material fact that needs to go to trial. Um, so I'll move on to the next question. So um, the next question is, has the plaintiff been able to identify um, through discovery or deposition written or unwritten policies that direct the production of confidential material as a part of the process for complying with the PRA requests? And um, we would submit, the plaintiff would submit to this court that the un unwritten policy of engaging in a pattern and practice of overdisclosing personal and private information to avoid lawsuits under the Public Records Act um, is the unwritten policy. And so discovery was cut short. Um, defendants um, have objected to producing discovery. Um, there was there has um, been two sets of discovery requests made so far. Um, defendants have um, objected, I think, to almost everyone. I, if, if I'm wrong, please correct me. Um, but they did produce um, some documents to the first set of discovery requests um, over objection, um, and they didn't produce many of the many of the requests. But they did produce some documents to the first request. They didn't produce any documents to the second set of discovery requests. So we haven't had a chance for depositions. We haven't had a chance for discovery. Um, but based upon what we do have, we do have Defendant John Saunders's job description that states that um, she avoids lawsuits. It's not to comply with the Public Records Act. It's not to ensure people's rights, which is what the, the statute is for. 
It's to avoid lawsuits. It's to avoid liability. And in fact, um, in the response to the motion for summary judgment, the page that um, defend, or plaintiff quoted, it actually states that um, there's huge liability. It says that there was a study, I think, by King Five that talked about um, the hundreds of thousands of dollars that the agencies could be paying for Public Records Act violations. And that's in her job description. And so, um, a reasonable that King Five report is in her job description. It references it. It actually references King Five in her job description. Um, and the page is actually we didn't include the quote in the, but the page that we cited to, um, in the very introductory paragraph, I believe, is the page that um, mentions King Five. And so her job is not, and it actually mentions hundreds. I think the number is five hundred thousand um, dollars that they that they um, mention in that page. Actually, I can pull it up. So I'm on um, docket 130-1, and I believe I'm on page 10 out of 14. And there's a section that the first section of that page says working environmental conditions. The second page is other com other comments, and I'll just read, this is a paragraph, I'll just read to this court straight from what this says in her job description that was produced in initial disclosures. Quote, according to a February 2011 report by King TV News, fines under the Public Records Act have cost state agencies nearly $5 million in a recent five-year period. A number of fines for individual public records requests exceeded $500,000. A King TV report does not appear to include fines to opposing attorneys that are usually awarded by the courts, nor does it include uh, out-of-court settlements. From discussions with other, others in the transparency community, there appear to be a goodly number of out-of-court settlements. King TV's numbers do not include the salaries of the agency staff or the AAGs or the SAAGs assigned to litigate these lawsuits. King TV's report um, did not include the fines paid by the local cities and counties under the Public Records Act. While no surveys of these fines could be identified, one other city, Mesa, Washington, considered filing bankruptcy or unincorporating itself in the face of losing a single Public Records Act lawsuit. The fine was over $250,000 for non-responding in a timely manner. And this is what plaintiffs were getting at um, in the introduction to the um, response to summary judgment. Her job description clearly says that um, she is to um, avoid lawsuits. And this goes to this court's in inquiry. Well, counsel, isn't she supposed to avoid lawsuits in both directions? In other words, you avoid being fined for underproduction, but you also avoid being sued for overproduction. Could you repeat that? I'm sorry, I didn't catch that. In other words, certainly any person in this job is supposed to do it well, but their job is to ensure that the state does not get sued for underproduction or failure to produce or failure to produce in a timely manner, just as they are required to not get sued for overproduction or violating people's rights because they have disclosed something, like this lawsuit. So isn't there responsibility to be on both sides of that line? Um, I would, um, I agree with most of that statement, Your Honor, um, but the part that um, plaintiff disagrees with is that the record is absent of any lawsuit of public records over disclosure. And to be honest, plaintiff hasn't seen a lawsuit over um, over disclosure, and that's why it's been difficult. And I think that defendants have touched upon this point um, when they spoke during their oral argument. They said there's not a lot of case law really about this subject because it really hasn't happened before, to the best of our knowledge. Um, I'll speak to for myself. To the best of my <laughs> knowledge, it really hasn't happened before, and I haven't seen it in any of the documents to this court. So doesn't that go, <laughs> doesn't that cut against your position that they're doing it well because apparently there haven't been a lot of over, ex over disclosure cases. So, you know, you're telling me that there's a pattern or practice here of over disclosure and yet you can't find anything else. I, I would disagree with that, Your Honor. Um, so the reason why I would submit to this court, the reason why there are not more cases for overdisclosure is because there's not a clear path for legal redress as there is for um, 
as there is for under disclosure or for withholding documents. Um, it's very clear in the statute, 40, RCW 42.56.550 section 4, that, that provides a cause of action under state law in order to sue for under disclosure. There is no clear um, cause of action for over disclosure. We had to find a constitutional argument in order to be able to argue that. And um, there's been a lot of criticism for even going along that route. And there doesn't appear to be any other better legal option. Let me back you up here just a minute. One of the questions that I ask is what was of the pages that were disclosed, 69 to 77 in docket number 34. You talked to me about the pipette issue. You know, what about that rises to the level of constitutional violation? What is so outrageous about revealing that somebody's thumb doesn't work right? Uh, thank you, Your Honor. Um, and I think that, that kind of hits home to what I, I think that we're kind of missing each other, and I appreciate that question. Um, there doesn't seem to be a clear definition that we're using about what medical information is, and I think that's the problem. Um, defendants come up in their oral argument, they say, look, it has to be, it has to shock the conscience and other things, but there doesn't seem to be a clear definition, and plaintiff tries to rely upon the ADA and HIPAA in order to provide a definition for what medical information is in order to give this court a bright line standard um, to answer your question. What can we look towards to determine whether it's a constitutional violation for um, the disclosure. Is it somebody's thumb that's not working or is it um, the disclosure of a controversial disease such as um, HIV and AIDS? Um, and I think that's what this court is getting at. Um, what sort of medical information actually rises to a constitutional level? Well, I'm talking about this disclosure. You're claiming there's a disclosure. I'm, I'm asking you, what about these pages is so outrageous or shocking or so embarrassing that it rises to a constitutional level? Um, your Honor, and to answer your question as direct as I can, um, any disclosure about a disability is shocking. Um, nobody should have to worry about in the government disclosing their disability. Um, no matter what the disability is, any disability should be private, and that's within the realm of the individual. And so what's shocking about this information is just that uh, the government thinks that, that, that it's okay in order to release any of this information. So that would make any disclosure whatsoever shocking if they, yeah, about anything. Uh, you know, a mole on your hand or, or you know, a bunion. You're saying that, that any disclosure of medical information is shocking that it rises to a constitutional uh, mandate. Yes, Your Honor, and let me draw a distinction if I may. So if this is a police report and let's say I'm being arrested and the police report says that there's a mole on my hand and that's released, the police report is released to the public, I don't think there's a constitutional protection in that mole on my hand in the police report. However, if the mole on my hand is on a doctor's note that's um, produced to the public by the government, I absolutely think that there's a constitutional protection in that mole on my hand being produced to the public when it's on a doctor's report. I think that that where the mole on the hand, which document it relies in, it lies in, um, is where it gets its constitutional protection from. So you're telling me that I should fashion a rule that says any time a doctor, what about, what about a, a medic, uh, what about a nurse, what about a chiropractor? Any time it falls under any medical notation, that's a constitutional violation. That no matter what the issue is, it shocks to the point of rising to a constitutional issue? Um, I, I would say um, yes, Your Honor. Um, and that's why um, plaintiff has been trying to draw comparisons to the ADA and to HIPAA. And while we're not relying upon the ADA and HIPAA, as case law shows that just release of the medical information is a constitutional violation, I think that um, this court can look to ADA and HIPAA to decide what information is proper to disclose and what information is not proper to disclose under the constitutional, uh, under the Fourth and Fourteenth Amendment of the United States Constitution. And I think that when we look to um, the ADA, especially as guidance for what information is acceptable in order to disclose, um, the ADA and the case law interpreting the ADA makes it um, clear that any 
information about a person's disability or the perception about a person's disability is prohibited and that shocks the conscience just like I was telling this court before any mention or perception about a person's disability should not be disclosed by the government so going to this court's question about dockets 34 through uh, docket 34 69 through 77 any mention of her disability was off limits or any mention of that could lead to a perception of her disability was off limits um, and Unless this court has other questions, I'll just keep moving on with the uh, um, pre-prepared questions. I believe that um, we're at, um, has the plaintiff been able to identify through discovery or deposition um, written or unwritten policies that direct the production of confidential information or confidential material as a part of the process for complying with the Public Records Act request? And the unwritten policy of engaging in a pattern and practice of overdisclosing personal and private information to avoid lawsuits under the Public Records Act, um, as I said, I think I already answered this was in her, um, is in Defendant John Saunders' job description. And so the next question is, um, can plaintiffs cite to a single case where negligently producing personal medical information pursuant to the Public Records Act request has been held to amount to an unreasonable search and seizure? in violation of the Fourth Amendment. And I would like to draw this court's attention to Norman Bloodsaw v. Lawrence Berkeley Laboratory, and that's 135 F. 3rd, 1260, at page 1269, and that's a Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals case from 1998. And in the um, Norman Bloodsaw case, the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals says, quote, the non-consensual retrieval of previously unrevealed medical information that may be unknown to even plaintiffs, um, these tests may also, uh, may also be viewed as searches in violation of the Fourth Amendment right um, that require a Fourth Amendment scrutiny. These tested issues in this case um, can implicate rights protected under both the Fourth Amendment and the Due Process Clause of the Fifth or Fourteenth Amendments, end quote. And so the Norman, Blake, uh, the Norman Bloodsaw Court actually um, analyzed the Fourth Amendment and they said the unlawful disclosure of, um, or the, um, the previous unrevealed medical information could implicate the Fourth Amendment. And so that's a case where it's been directly held upon. But um, even there, as I talked about in the beginning, um, the Fourth Amendment protects the search and the seizure. And the commingling of the, of the medical information is um, what violates the Fourth Amendment. The Whalen Court um, I'm sorry, I don't have the citation. It's the United States Supreme Court case, I think, from 1976. Off the top of my head, the, the Whalen Court, Justice Brennan in the Whalen Court, oh, it's Whalen v. Roe, um, 429, U.S. 589, at page 607. And Justice Brennan said in the concurring opinion there that the Fourth Amendment puts limits not only on the information, um, the, type of, the type of information the state may gather, but also on the means that they gather it. And in that case, they were talking, I believe, about a computer program um, that compiled a database of prescription drug information. And so there have been cases that have talked directly on point about what this court is, what this court is asking, about where negligently producing um, personal medical information um, and to be fair, this courts haven't talked about negligence or what standard, whether it's deliberate or intentional, but they've talked about the Fourth Amendment and the production of um, medical information implicating the Fourth Amendment. And I think this court can draw upon the other cases, um, and whether this is deliberate indifference or it's intentional through um, the pattern of practice, this, there is a disputed issue of material fact about this, that this has happened multiple times. And defendants just say that this is negligence, but there's policies and procedures, and um, defendant, I'm sorry, defendant Saunders has gone through training about this. And so they can't just claim that it's, that it's negligence because she knew not to produce this information. And if you know not to do something, and you do it multiple times, and your staff does it multiple times, it no longer is mere negligence. It rises at least to deliberate indifference, if not an intentional or deliberate conduct. And so I think when you look at that and then you look at the Fourth Amendment case law that says that the Fourth Amendment can um, be implicated with the disclosure of medical information, I think that meets your question, even though you're talking about negligence. Um, that 
we have a we have a situation here where um, it's alleged that there's a, that there's evidence that there's a pattern in practice, at least in the evidence most reasonably viewed um, towards Ms. D'Alessio, there is an evidence of pattern in practice, and then we have clear case law saying that the Fourth Amendment can be implicated um, through the disclosure of medical information, and so I think that meets um, this question of what this court is getting at in that question, and then um, the next question. Um, that this court asked is that defendants have cited to the Ninth Circuit case law or Ninth Circuit law that violates uh, that violations of HIPAA and the ADA cannot form the basis of a 1983 claim. How is plaintiff's position um, that defendants alleged HIPAA and ADA violations define the contours of the alleged um, constitutional of uh, the alleged violation of her constitutional rights any different than claiming um, those alleged violations on the basis for a 1983 claim? And Ms. D'Alessio uses HIPAA and the ADA as independent support for the Fourth and Fourteenth Amendment in case law interpreting it to define the contours of her um, constitutional rights. As I just explained, um, the Norman Bloodsaw Court um, didn't rely upon the ADA or HIPAA in order to define, in order to say that the Fourth Amendment could be implicated. Um, and other courts um, in the Fourteenth Amendment um, haven't done that either. And so whether it's the Fourth Amendment or the Fourteenth Amendment, this court has clear case law that there's a constitutional violation without the ADA and HIPAA. And I think that's the important point, is that the HIPAA and ADA are not needed in order to establish a constitutional violation because there's many cases that have been cited by plaintiffs that state that the disclosure of medical information, and we can, we can argue about what that disclosure actually is, um, whether, what, what shocks the conscience or things like that, but the disclosure of medical information um, can violate the, the Fourth Amendment and the Fourteenth Amendment to the United States Constitution. And they don't need the ADA or HIPAA in order to get there. And that's where defendants um, distort plaintiffs' arguments about that. They're saying, look, they're conflating the ADA um, and HIPAA and the Fourth Amendment and the Fourteenth Amendment, and that's not, that's not plaintiff's position at all. Plaintiff's position to this court is that um, the Fourth Amendment and the Fourteenth Amendment provide an independent basis for this court to rule upon, just like many other courts have found, without even considering the ADA and HIPAA, um, that there have been violations of the Constitution um, for the disclosure of private medical information. But when you look at that the Constitution can be, vi can be violated through the disclosure of private, private medical information, the court can then use the HIPAA and ADA as an independent basis to decide, as a bright line standard, to decide in instances such as this, um, if that is shocking or if that is unconscionable and if it does rise to that level. And so to answer this court's question, um, the reason why we haven't cited any case laws is because it's not necessary. Um, a violation of the Constitution occurs independently. And the statutory basis, as we talked about, um, as we try to talk about in the Nicholas versus Wallenstein case, um, the, the statutory basis provides, defines the contours of the privacy rights. Um, and the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals in Nicholas versus Wallenstein, which this court has cited in at least one of its orders, and I know that defendants have cited it a couple times too. In the Nicholas versus Wallenstein case um, from 266 F3rd 1083, the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals case from 2001, that court analyzed um, whether the disclosure of plaintiff's name through the Public Records Act, then the Public Disclosure Act, violated um, their right to privacy. The court wrote, quote, but the statute is of relevance in determining what privacy public, public personnel expected to have, end quote. And that's at page 1088. The court found, as a matter of law, that the names, that the quote, names involved in, that the names of the involved personnel were not exempt from disclosure, end quote. So the court then circled back and they said, okay, privacy, privacy rights can be involved, but you know what, this was an authorized disclosure. There was nothing exempting these names from disclosure under the Public Records Act. And that's the difference between the Nicholas, and Wallenstein, Nicholas versus Wallenstein case and what we have here. Um, this disclosure was clearly prohibited under the Public Records Act because HIPAA, ADA, and other statutes clearly prohibited it and exempted this information from disclosure under the Public Records Act. And so that's why privacy is implicated here, and privacy wasn't implicated in the Nicholas versus Wallenstein case. Um, defendants also argue, they cite cases, um, and they say that, uh, they cite um, 
there's the iceberg case and something else. Um, but those cases, um, they argue that the ADA can't even be used in order to define um, the ADA and HIPAA can't even be used to define the Fourth Amendment or the Fourteenth Amendment. And they cite the Iceberg case and I think the Vinson case, um, which I think the Vinson case is a published Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals case. But in both of those cases, um, they had independent ADA claims. And I believe that they both cited Title II of the ADA. And they, they, argued, they, they argued to the merits whether there was um, ADA violations. And then also they doubled back, and to use defendant's words, they doubled back and um, they, they used the ADA again under 1983. So it was kind of like they were double dipping on this ADA claim. They made the same arguments under the ADA as they used um, under 1983. And they said, look, um, this action violated the ADA and then it also violated 1983 because it violated the ADA. And that's the difference between what we're having here. Um, plaintiff's, argument, plaintiff's arguments here in this court is that the Constitution provides its own um, basis, as many cases have held, that the Fourth Amendment and the Fourteenth Amendment can be um, violated through the disclosure of medical information. And you don't need the ADA in order to get there, although it is very helpful and it is very persuasive in order to identify where those contours actually are. And then um, I'll move to this court's, I believe, this court's Second last question, um, what authority does this plaintiff have for the arguments that one of the recognized legal standards above negligence is a pattern and practice of behavior? Um, I believe this was addressed before, I'll go over it quickly. Um, but um, the Western District of Washington ruled in an unpublished case in Thompson versus the City of Olympia this year in 2019 that to impose liability under 1983, a plaintiff must show one, um, that they were deprived of the constitutional rights by defendants and their employees while acting under the color state law. Two, defendants have customs or policies which amount to deliber deliberate indifference to their constitutional rights. And three, that these policies are moving, are the moving force behind the constitutional violations. And that case cites um, Lee versus the city of Los Angeles, which is a uh, published case from uh, 250 F3rd 668, which is the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals case. So, in showing deliberate indifference, um, ordinarily requires demonstrating a pattern of similar constitutional violations by untrained employees. Here we have trained employees, which should be even more egregious. Um, it's not just untrained employees who are kind of guessing as to what's going on, or they believe that this violates the Constitution. These are trained employees that know the difference. Um, Ms. Um, Defendant Saunders' job description states that she is trained. She is expected to know specifically about HIPAA and the ADA in her job description. And so this is even more egregious because it's a knowing violation at that point, whereas untrained employees believe um, that they are acting the right way, but if they do it repeatedly, it becomes deliberate indifference. As I argued before, this rises above deliberate indifference because she was trained and she was expected to know the law. She was expected to know HIPAA. She was expected to know ADA. And as the director and as the public records officer, she was expected um, under state statute to ensure compliance with the people who are disclosing those requests underneath her. So that's what I believe answered this court's question about the recognized legal standard above negligence, is that we're arguing um, through, through a pattern of practice that it's at least deliberate indifference, if not intentional. With more discovery, I believe that we can prove that. And the last question, um, and I'll just go over this real quickly for this court, um, is what evidence does plaintiff have for the number of instances that allegedly um, of the alleged improper disclosure of information regarding the third parties to which she can testify represents a statistically um, significant sample such as that she can um, establish that it represents a pattern of practice by defendants. Um, we haven't been given discovery um, begin very limited discovery and so we would have to look at to answer this course question honestly we would have to we would have to look at all the disclosures by Ms. D'Alessio um, and we'd have to look at um, all the disclosures by defendants to know if there's a true pattern in practice but on the evidence in front of us um, it has been identified that um, defendants disclose disability information about Ms. D'Alessio to Mr. Betts and um, defendants have disclosed um, private medical information 
about Ms. D'Alessio to herself, and defendants have not identified any information to show that this behavior has stopped, or even testified to say that they haven't done it since. And that information is solely within the realm of defendants. In fact, the United States Supreme Court has stated, quote, it's observed that the facts of good faith and the facts of underlying immunity depend on the facts peculiar, peculiarly within the knowledge and control of the defendants, end quote. And um, that's Schultia v. Wood at 47 F. 3rd, 1427 at page 1431, which is a Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals case from 1905, which is quoting Gomez v. Toledo, which is cited in our um, response brief. And so that's something that um, I would respectfully submit to this court, that that's defendants burden to prove, and they haven't proved that. They haven't even conclusory stated that this hasn't happened again, and so there's no way to know, and the only evidence in front of this court is that it's happened to Mr. Betts. Uh, this information was disclosed to Mr. Betts. This information was disclosed to Ms. D'Alessio, and that there's been nothing in the record to say that it hasn't happened again. The reasonable inference is, is that it has happened again, and we just don't know it yet. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Freeman, do you wish to respond? Um, I, I'd like to respond to a couple of points, and certainly, Your Honor, if you have any questions, um, I am happy to answer any questions. If okay, well, the well, first question is, okay. counsel takes the position that any disclosure of any medical information, no matter what its nature or how de minimis, uh, is a constitutional violation. Yes, um, and that's just not that's just not the case. Um, the case law makes it clear um, that there is a different and unique standard to establish a right to privacy that rises to the level of protection by the U.S. Constitution. The U.S. Constitution existed long before HIPAA, long before ADA, long before any number of federal or state statutes, in fact, long before the, the Public Records Act in the state of Washington as well, and it will continue on after. Um, one of the, the specific reasons why, um, why HIPAA and ADA cannot be used, relied on, or referred to to delineate the scope of a constitutional interest here is because that's a federal statute that was adopted by Congress, and Congress adopted it for a reason. Um, and Congress said within the statute, here's the reasons we're adopting these statutes, here's where they apply, and has specifically provided as a balance to whatever interest the, gov the federal government decided was important, um, here are the remedies that are available if you violate the terms of that particular statute. It's very clear both based on that legislation and based on federal case law um, that, that, that um, the, rem the remedial scheme available under HIPAA and ADA is limited to um, the purposes for which it was passed and cannot be used to establish you know, outside the, the four corners of that remedial scheme, a different constitutional claim. When we turn to the cases that are most on point here, which are the number of cases cited, the, the Sumi case, the Cooksey case, the Weisberg case, Annabelle, um, and the Jarvis v. Wellman cases, those all actually, those are all federal cases that actually did involve um, situations where specifically medical information and often very um, personal and private medical information was disclosed, sometimes about employees. Uh, one involved a city who uh, that disclosed their police chief had been undergoing psychiatric treatment and discussed a fitness for duty evaluation and its results. One involved a sexual assault victim whose medical records were released to her father who happened to be the perpetrator. Um, one involved other medical records like EAP medical records of an employee that were released. And in each of those cases, these courts take great pains to remind um, the reader that um, rights that are protected by the United States Constitution are very, very specific. And this, the threshold to meet an actual constitutional right of privacy is very, very limited. And that's where that uh, language comes from the, that says the, the information itself, not just, there is no holding that says medical information in and of itself is protected by the Constitution or does uh, rise to the level of, of constitutional protection. Um, 
the courts say the information disclosed must either be a shocking degradation or an egregious humiliation. Um, and those are all in the cases where they are, from a fundamental standpoint, already discussing medical information. There is no case that says any disclosure of medical information, however minor or however mundane or even however so private or embarrassing, um, rises to that shocking degradation or egregious humiliation standard that's required um, to be covered by the United States Constitution. The, the federal courts recognize that there are all of these other remedial statutes that in the right context, which is not present here, there may be other remedial schemes if something occurs. This is all, you know, comes back to the balancing act that both Congress and the state legislature in Washington has done when they adopted also uh, statutes like the Public Records Act that require these employees to go through this exercise. Let's talk about the specific pages here, the pages 69 to 77. Yes. What medical information do you believe is revealed there, if any? Um, I actually don't think any medical information is revealed. In the pages that were produced to Mr. Betts, um, the first page is a, a standard form that exists at the university, and it's called a disability accommodation form. And there, is, there are some marks on there that look like it may have been filled out, but there is absolutely nothing on that form that is readable. I can't read any medical information about anybody on that form or even see a name. The next few pages involve a typical workplace accommodation letter. And as you can see, when you look at the pages, uh, great pains have been taken to redact certain words and certain phrases that presumably um, actually uh, describe any uh, medical condition. Um, counsel suggested that a medical condition could be derived from reading that letter because it referenced some of the plaintiff's job duties, and I, I disagree that that is in any way a disclosure of medical information. Um, that is, in um, again, pursuant to the Public Records Act law that the university employees are required to comply with, that law provides guidance that um, instructs them to um, make efforts to not just withhold documents, but where possible to redact specific medical information, which was clearly done by Ms. Swenson here. The so a reference to a pipette isn't necessarily a reference to having a bad thumb? No, Your Honor. That's a, simply a reference to part of the job duties. Um, there is nothing in there that describes why someone may maybe could or could not use a pipette. And in fact, just doesn't reference medical information at all. And let me go one step further. Even if it had, um, even if there was a reference in that letter that was not redacted about a thumb problem that made it difficult to use a pipette, that, that simply is not the type of shockingly degrading uh, medical and private medical information that would, again, rise to that level of a of a constitutional violation. The last set of documents counsel described as um, something filled out by the supervisor, that's actually not what it is. If you look at the document, it's not signed by a doctor or anything like that. It's called a job analysis. And it is a, um, a standard form, again, where someone from a different office comes in and watches, uh, gathers information and watches what um, that particular job requires. And then they fill out this form that is sent with an employee to their doctor to ask the doctor if they can do X, Y, and Z. The form itself was just prepared by someone who was analyzing the job, not Ms. Delessio herself. And it, it includes no medical information at all. It's not from a doctor. And more like a vocational evaluation? It's exactly like a vocational evaluation. All right. Um, Let me ask you another question yeah. then, turning to the issue of your... Opposing counsel seems to think that you have the burden of both persuasion and production here. Is that correct? I, uh, no, Your Honor, I would disagree. Um, we have been involved in this lawsuit for a few years. I've heard some uh, references to discovery. We have engaged in, in a, a lot of discovery. Um, plaintiff has brought motions to compel. Court has ruled on motions to compel. We're now at the summary judgment stage, and this is the third time that we have tried to get before the court moving for summary judgment, which at that point prompts the plaintiff to then produce evidence that would overcome um, the, 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 the legal standards we've set forth that entitle my clients to dismissal. Um, plaintiffs have the burden of proof at trial. Plaintiffs at this point have the burden to produce evidence to show that there is a question of material fact that actually precludes the court from ruling on these claims, and at this point there is not. I do not agree with plaintiff's statements that defendants have 
a burden to, I'm, I'm, I wasn't quite, I, I wasn't quite clear in their arguments, but I don't agree with those statements. Okay. Is there anything else you'd like to argue to me? Um, I think the rest of it is fairly self-explanatory. There was a lot of time spent on um, Eliza Saunders' job description. I just, I don't, I disagree that that in any way is evidence of any specific action that Ms. Saunders took in this case or that any other defendant took. Um, plaintiff has failed to demonstrate either legally or with evidence that any defendant who is being sued in this case has uh, violated Ms. D'Alessio's constitutional rights um, or that should should not be dismissed um, because they're entitled to qualified immunity from all of the claims and it asks that you enter an order dismissing the remaining claims against the remaining defendants. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you for your arguments, counsel. I will be um, filing a written opinion for you, and I'm hoping to get that to you by the close of business this Friday. So um, thank you. Have a good afternoon, and uh, please look for the order. Thank you. Please rise. Court is in recess.